Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if it is your first time here. Today's video is going to be my January reading wrap up and honestly I am astonished at the number of books that I managed to read or listen to in the month of January. Um, I was feeling a little bit reading slumpy at the end of December, not that I didn't enjoy what I read in December but I just was feeling a little bit uninspired about what I was going to pick up next um, and then I started the year with a fantastic read um, and I just it just really went from there I had quite a solid reading month um, as usual I'm going to talk you through the books that I read in the order that I read or listened to them um, so without further ado let's jump straight in. So the first book that I read in the month of January honestly blew me away. If I could give it more than five stars I absolutely would. If I could put it in the hands of every reader I absolutely would. It just was fantastic and that is Lovely War by Julie Berry. So this is quite an interesting story. We are following four different characters whose lives have intertwined basically because of the events of the First World War and essentially it's a World War I romance uh, but the twist with this book is that it is narrated by the Greek gods so Aphrodite is caught in a moment of indiscretion with Ares by her husband and in order to get herself off the hook she basically sits them all down and decides to tell the greatest love story of all time and it sounds like a really bonkers concept and you might think how on earth can you bring world war one fiction and greek gods together but trust me it works um it is extremely well written it is beautiful it is so well executed it's fantastic the parts of the story that were narrated by Hades just they gave me chills it brought me to tears it was fantastic like I, I cannot praise this book enough and I almost don't want to say too much because I really feel like this is just a book best going into as blind as you can and experiencing the wonderful wonderful storytelling as it unfolds as I said I gave it five stars the only criticism that I would have is that we are following four characters and we get slightly more of two characters more than the other two and I would have liked it to be a little bit more balanced but honestly apart from that I cannot fault it. It was a fantastic book to start my reading year, it's just a fantastic book all round. World War One meets Greek gods meets romance, it is beautiful, heartwarming, heart-wrenching perfection. I loved it. I loved it. Then I picked up The Beauty of Darkness by Mary E. Pearson. This is the third and final book in the Remnant Chronicles trilogy um, and I am very glad that I read this because one of my goals this year was to finish the series that I have already started but I do have a few issues with it. I gave it three stars on Goodreads and I feel like the first book in this series, the premise of the first book in this series was so interesting and the way it was set up it was really interesting and caught my attention but that unique premise became the downfall of books two and three. So basically in the first book we meet Leah, a 17 year old princess of a kingdom and she flees on her wedding day and she is pursued by two characters. We have an assassin and we have the jilted prince and we read from three points of view. We read from Leah's point of view and then the assassin and then the prince but we don't know who is the assassin and who is the prince and it gives the book and the story a tension and a momentum and a sense of anticipation that makes it really quite compelling to read. Unfortunately by the time you get to the end of book one you know who is who of the two male characters and that became the issue for me in books two and three in that the, the, the voices of the characters were so similar there was no there wasn't enough differentiation and in the third book we gain another point of view that again was so similar to the other three and I would often find myself getting confused about 
which character I was reading um, and I would think to myself hang on I thought I was reading from this character and they were over here and now they're over there it was just very very samey unfortunately so what made it really interesting in book one then became its major flaw really I also feel like the author failed to capitalize on some of the really interesting concepts that she had introduced the main character Leah has some kind of inherited magical ability or skill but it's never really properly explored or explained um, and then in addition to that we are building to this major battle at the end and it's all over so in this book there is this huge culmination this big battle um, where everything's going to come to a point and it's over in about a paragraph which just felt really lacklustre considering all the momentum and the build-up that we had had to this moment so I really just felt like it didn't make the most of what it had and the world building that the author had done this is also a spoiler so I'll leave a time stamp here if you want to read this series or if you are currently reading this series and you want to skip this but Rafe was one of my favourite characters. Rafe is the assassin, he was one of my favourite characters and in this book I felt like he was forced into a romance that just did not work for me at all. I feel like it lacked depth for his character. He is, if you've not read the series, he is basically obsessed with Leah. He loves Leah, he wants to be with Leah, but Leah wants to be with the prince and so it became this, if I can't have you, I'll have your best friend instead scenario. And it just didn't, it just didn't feel right, I didn't buy it and it basically ruined the latter half of this book for me. So on the whole, wasn't blown away by this series. I do think that there are better YA fantasy series out there. Would I recommend this one? Probably not. Not unless you had a burning desire to read it and see it for yourself. I almost feel like it should have just been a standalone book. The first book was good and it should have just been left at that. Books two and books three didn't really feel like they added much in terms of the story and that was just a little bit of a letdown for me. So a swing and a miss unfortunately. I gave it three stars on Goodreads. It was okay, nothing groundbreaking. There are better series out there. Then I read The Duke and I by Julia Quinn. This is book one of the Bridgerton Regency Romance series that's currently everywhere uh, thanks to the Netflix series. I don't want to spend too much time talking about this. I gave it one star on Goodreads. If they did minus stars I would probably have given it a minus. I didn't want to leave it unrated because I only leave non-fiction unrated. Didn't enjoy it for one particular reason. If you want to watch my full reading experience, I did film a reading vlog. I will leave the link in the description bar down below. This is a little bit of a spoiler, so again, I will leave a timestamp if you plan on reading it and you don't want to spoil yourself. But the issue for me, um, as you'll know if you watch the vlog, is the issue of lack of consent. And I have been thinking about it, despite the fact that I would rather have not. I have been thinking about it. And it's not so much just the lack of consent as the way that the author failed to deal with it adequately and attempts to romanticise Daphne and Simon's relationship and portray them at the end as this fantastic couple. But really, she hasn't dealt with this huge issue that occurs right at the beginning of their relationship. It's not that characters cannot be flawed and it's not that as people we are not flawed and that we make mistakes we make mistakes in our relationships we make mistakes in our marriages that happens i get that and people make poor choices especially when they are coming from a place of hurt i get that it's the way that the author failed to deal with it and wanted to either romanticize it or brush it under the carpet and pretend like it was all all right and it really wasn't she could have dealt with it in a much better way and i would have been happy but i wasn't so that's that we're done I will not be reading any of the rest of the books I've had a few messages from people saying the rest of the books are brilliant you should definitely read them I'm not particularly interested in that I am not writing off Regency Romance I would be interested in coming across some different authors but I'm not gonna go back into that series that is done for me so we move on. And then for a total change of pace I picked up Away with the Penguins by Hazel Pryor and honestly 
if you are in need of some escapism at the moment I cannot recommend either Lovely War or Away with the Penguins enough. Both are just fantastic opportunities to block out whatever else is going on and just get lost in a lovely story for a little while. So Away with the Penguins is contemporary. We are predominantly following the story of Veronica McCready, a lady in her 80s who lives by herself in a house in Scotland and over the years she has accumulated a rather vast fortune and she wants to find a cause to leave it to. Having no living relatives that she knows of, she's looking for something worthwhile basically to leave her money to. And then one day she is watching a documentary and she discovers there is a group of scientists studying a colony of penguins out in the Antarctic and she decides that she wants to leave her money to this project uh, but more than that she wants to go out and visit the scientists and so she sets off on this journey. We also then subsequently discover that Veronica does have a grandson um, and they meet and they don't have the best initial impression so we read predominantly from Veronica's point of view but then we also read from the grandson's point of view and we begin to also jump back in time and discover a little bit more about Veronica's past and why she is the way that she is because right from the beginning it's very obvious that she is no nonsense, um, she's very sure with people she doesn't like to connect she holds herself aloof um, which is very interesting and funny and amusing to read but also kind of sad and we begin to follow and understand what led Veronica to the point where she is the way that she is today and it's just yeah it's just a very heartwarming heart-wrenching cozy escapism story it's not without its flaws it's not perfect but in terms of escapism levels and obviously the added addition of the cuteness of the penguins I just thought it was great. I would highly, highly recommend it. I gave it four and a half stars. Then I read The 10,000 Doors of January by Alex E. Harrow. This is a fantasy story about a young girl called January who lives with lives as a ward of a man called Mr Locke and January's father works for Mr Locke and he goes traveling all over the world uncovering unique artifacts and bringing them back for Mr Locke to either sell or to display and as part of the agreement January lives with Mr Locke while her father does this and when January is young she has a slightly strange experience in that she comes across across a door in the middle of a field and she opens the door and discovers that it leads into a world quite unlike the one that she is in but she doesn't go through the door she kind of retreats and she tells Mr Locke about this experience and he basically brushes it off and says it's all nonsense it's all in her head and she just needs to stop and behave. Flash forward a number of years and January begins to realise that perhaps there is more to her early experience than she thought and that maybe dotted all around the world there might be portals into other worlds and so begins something of an adventure story. This is, this was a really good book, I really enjoyed the concept, I really enjoyed the premise. The thing that lets it down a little bit is the writing style. It's very descriptive and very flowery to the point of for example, why say something in four words that you could say in 14? And I often, especially in the beginning, found myself having to go back and reread sections because I would read something and then think, I have no idea what I have just read. Go back to the beginning and read it again. It's good, it's enjoyable, it's fascinating. I liked the different characters, I liked the character development, I liked the concept, as I said. It is at its heart an adventure story, but also a story about finding where you belong. So January feels very isolated and she feels very much like she doesn't belong in uh, Mr. Locke's house or with the people that ha she has around her. And it's about what you, yeah, how you, how you live when you feel that sense of displacement and about finding your people. And we also have a little love story that blends through. One of the interesting things actually um, is that January at the beginning finds a book called The Ten Thousand Doors and so we read January's story but then we also read the book that January is reading which is another story. So we have two concurrent stories that 
eventually come together and end up interlinking um, and it's very very good it's very well done I enjoyed it immensely as I said I don't feel like this book would be for everyone simply because of the writing style so don't be put off by it I guess I mean I stuck with it I was initially a little bit hesitant and I'm glad I stuck with it because it is a very unique and interesting story and I did enjoy it overall but I can see how it potentially wouldn't be everyone's cup of tea but yeah just another one that I'm very glad that I read. Next it was time for my book clubs pick if you don't know I run a book club called Just One More Page I will leave all the information that you need in the description bar down below. Each month this year we are picking something from a different genre to try and stretch ourselves as readers and for January we chose a fantasy. Now I would like to bracket this by saying that I think it's very difficult to find good quality fantasy that is standalone and that is accessible for people who have perhaps never read the fantasy genre before um, and in the end we went for An Enchantment of Ravens by Margaret Rogerson and it was actually very interesting when we had our live discussion at the end of the month to hear from the two different categories of people those who have read fantasy before and those who haven't because I feel like those of us who had read fantasy came at this from a much more critical place than the people who hadn't because this is a fantasy but it is also a romance and it's YA so it's quite um, basic in its storyline and it's also about fair folk so we have our protagonist Isabel who is a human she is a masterful portrait artist and the basic premise is that the fair folk are unable to craft anything for themselves so as vain as they are they rely on humans to make things for them and Isabel as I said is a portrait artist so the fair folk come to her to have their portraits drawn and painted and she is portrayed to us as a very savvy sharp young girl she has her head screwed on she knows how to negotiate with the fair folk so that they don't trick her until she is asked to paint the portrait of the autumn prince called Rook and she ends up falling for him and when she is painting his portrait she gives him a human emotion and that sets off a spiral of events that ultimately sees Rook abducting Isabel and taking her into the heart of the fair folk lands and in terms of its readability it was very well written the writing was very beautiful it was very easy to read and very easy to get into my issues with it were primarily that the author has chosen almost every single cliche that you could possibly think about fair folk and thrown it into this book and also it just wasn't very well developed in terms of its plot. We were given a lot of information about things that were then never expanded upon. For example, where Isabel lives, there is reference to the world beyond where humans can also live, presumably where the fair folk do not, but that is never expanded upon such so reference, but you never actually find out what it is. I also didn't buy into the romance which I kind of feel like is an important thing if you're reading a romance that you have to buy into the characters who are in that romance and I just didn't for the reason that we find out right at the beginning of the book that the fair folk use glamours to make themselves look more human and they are actually quite grotesque looking and Rook in particular is described by Isabel when she initially sees him without his glamour as almost a rotting husk of a creature and then she falls in love with him but it isn't like a beauty and the beast style falling in love with because every time she thinks of him or every time she thinks of how she's falling in love with him there is a reference to his physicality but it's the glamoured version of him so it's not that she's falling in love with his personality she's falling in love with the way that he physically looks except he doesn't actually look like that because it's a glamour and so just it just didn't work there were too many different things that just didn't come together sufficiently for me but as I said for those who have never read fantasy before they really enjoyed it so I think it was just coming at it with a more critical eye as someone who has read quite a bit of this type of fantasy so yeah it was okay I imagine maybe if I was the target audience so if I was a 14 15 year old I would lap this up but it just missed the mark a little bit for me unfortunately 
Then we come to essentially the end of an era because I picked up Wrath by John Gwynn. This is the final and fourth book in John Gwynn's Faithful and the Fallen series. If you've been watching my wrap-ups then you'll know that I've been reading these one a month for the last four months um, and it has finally come to an end. Not finally, I, like I've, I've enjoyed the experience. I said that like I, it was a drag. I've enjoyed the experience but yes it is now finished. Um, so this is adult high fantasy. We are following a whole host of different characters set within the world that John Gwynn has created, the banished lands. There is political intrigue, there is magic, there is coming of age, there are heroes and villains, there are creatures of old, there is a whole lot going on and we follow various different characters throughout the four books and it is good. I mean it is a long haul, each book is massive, we have kind of our on the ground everyday storyline and then we have a big overarching storyline and everything comes to a final point in this book and it is fairly well done. I have said this so many times that I feel like a broken record but this is very tropey in terms of its fantasy and in terms of its elements but it is done pretty well. I will say I gave this four stars. I was going to give it four and a half. The reason that it lost the half star is simply because of the body count by the time we get to the end of this book. I feel like John Gwynn got three quarters of the way through writing it, realised that too many of his characters were going to survive and then just decided to get rid of a load of them, including unfortunately my favourite character not happy about that at all. Um, but yeah, on the whole, this is just a very enjoyable high fantasy series and I would definitely recommend them. Just go in knowing that it's a time commitment. I did, I have to say as well, also um, had quite a lot of questions that were left unanswered when I got to the end and it turns out that John Gwynn has written another series set sometime later but within the same world that answers potentially, according to James, a lot of the questions that I was left with. And I don't know if I like that. I don't know if I like it when authors just leave things unfinished because they know they're going to come back to them because it's like tricking you into having to read the later books or forever be wondering what the outcome is of the questions that you have. Uh, I don't know. It's enjoyable. Would I recommend it? Yes. But just go in knowing it's not, there's no like major reveals or jaw dropping moments or anything like that. It's just a very enjoyable ride and I'm very glad that I got to the end. I didn't know if I would be able to do it after reading Ruin, but we did it. We got there. Then I finished listening to The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. I listened to this throughout the month of January whilst I was doing my cross stitch. This is the story of twin sisters Desiree and Stella who live in an all black community in the south of America and when they are 16 they both run away to New Orleans to try and start a new life and then one day Stella just ups and disappears and Desiree comes to discover that Stella has decided to do what is called passing over, so living her life as a white woman because she is incredibly pale skinned. The community where the girls grew up was a community of very light skinned people of colour and so Stella has decided to pass over and live her life as a white woman and we follow the impact of that. We follow Desiree's story as she marries and has a daughter called Jude and then we follow some of Jude's story. We follow Stella's story as she marries and has a daughter called Kennedy and we follow some of Stella's story, some of Kennedy's story and then as you might expect everything kind of comes to a point when Kennedy and Jude meet. Listening to this on audio was actually quite an interesting experience because we move forwards in time. I think we end up in the early 1990s and but within that we jump backwards and forwards in time so we'll be so we'll start with something that's happening in the 1980s but then one of the characters will be thinking about something that happened in the past so you end up jumping backwards and forwards quite a lot and I did find it a little bit distracting to try and remember whereabouts within the storyline within the timeline of the story that we were. I don't know if that would have helped if I'd had the physical book and I'd been able to flick back and reorientate myself with where we were, I don't know. I thought that the audiobook was narrated extremely well. I really felt each character's individual voice. I have to say if you've read the book 
Early was my absolute favourite character. I wish we'd had much more of him. The interaction between Early and Adele, who is the girl's mother, at the end was utterly heartbreaking and moving. I also really enjoyed following Jude's story although that is very difficult to listen to. There are trigger warnings in this book for domestic violence and also for racism and extreme bullying. And I did find Jude's story very difficult to listen to. Um, but on the whole, I thought this was great. I really enjoyed it. As I say, I did have some issues with the flip-flopping timeline and skipping around. I also thought that it lacked a little bit of resolution. Now, on the one hand, part of me thinks that that's actually very accurate because life does not always get tied up neatly in a bow at the end and there are ultimately going to be things that are unresolved and don't just all come together very nicely and then the other half of me thinks yeah but it's a story <laughs> it's a story and I wanted some full circle type resolution and that does not happen but on the whole I enjoyed it greatly um, I enjoyed that we crossed over into several generations I enjoyed the way it looked at the actions and the decisions that ultimately determine who we are as people, whether we are impacted by things that have happened generations before, how, how our decisions then impact our children and their experiences, all just done very, very well. Then the final book that I read this month was a much anticipated read for me and that is The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Clune. So this is a middle grade book and we are following the story of Linus Baker, a caseworker who works for the department in charge of magical youth and his job is basically to visit orphanages where magical children are staying and make sure that those children are being well looked after and he has done this without complaint for the last 17 years and by all accounts he's pretty good at his job and then one day he is summoned to the office of extremely upper management and given a highly classified task he has to go to an orphanage that nobody knows about and assess whether the children there are being well looked after and these children are there because they are considered some of the most dangerous children in the world as you might expect, when Linus gets there, everything that he thought that he knew about his job, about himself, about life in general, it gets turned up side down on its head. And this is a story ultimately about belonging, it's a story about family, it's a story about whether your family is your, you know, is your blood relative or whether it's about the people that you choose to have around you. I have to say that Chauncey, with his bellhop dreams, literally made my heart hurt every time I had to read about him. He was just so sweet and wholesome and I could, I could have just read a whole book about Chauncey to be honest. I just thought it was wonderful. I mean the whole book on its own is just a very heartwarming sweet story and um, I enjoyed it immensely. One of the main issues that I had actually was with Linus's character and the way that the author decided to depict him. So right at the beginning we are told that Linus is carrying a little bit of extra weight around his middle and the doctor has told him that he has to lose the weight for his health and that's fine. But we are then subsequently told about how round Linus is or about his spare tire or how unfit or overweight he is at almost every opportunity to the point where it was I felt it was very noticeable and almost edged into being a little bit on the fat shaming side. I mean I don't have an issue with being told about the physicality of a character and it would have been fine for us to know that at the beginning and then maybe when he was going for a walk on the island to be like oh he was a little bit out of breath, he really needed to do something about that extra weight, that's fine but it wasn't, it was constant, a constant reminder. He bumped into the desks because he was overweight, one of the children pointed out how round he was, he couldn't put that outfit on because he was overweight, it was just a constant barrier of being told how overweight Linus was and I just thought that it was a little bit unnecessary um, and just soured the book a tiny bit for me because apart from that I thought that it was very very enjoyable as I say it's a very heartwarming very quirky very sweet charming story um, and I did thoroughly enjoy it apart from that one element um, yeah I gave it four stars 
thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it so there you go they are all the books that i read in the month of january uh do leave me a comment let me know if you've read any of the books that i talked about let me know what your favorite read was in january i always love to chat more with you in the comments if you enjoyed this video please do give it a thumbs up subscribe to the channel if you aren't already as i've said thank you very much for watching i hope that you are all keeping safe and well and i will see you all soon